Uh, well, thank you all for coming in. Uh, my name is Brad Birch. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, uh, or MAPS. Uh, it's a nonprofit uh, research uh, and uh, education organization that's been working since 1986 to create safe contexts for the beneficial uses of psychedelics uh, and marijuana. So um, I'm working here at the border um, of those two compounds and those two areas of research, and uh, I'm um, really excited to be here facilitating this this panel with this really um, great great group of experts from all over the psychedelic and marijuana and medical marijuana fields. Um, a lot of different um, perspectives here that I'm really excited to bring into this really interesting topic that 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 for me um, uh, takes up a lot of my intellectual. Uh, capacity, uh, so it's nice to bring in so many extra perspectives. Um, so the the topic of this of this session is um, uh, is uh, communication strategies, uh, psychedelics as the new pot question mark, and I, I really want to focus on that on that question mark. Um, I think uh, it's it's really easy as we see the legitimization of drugs happen in certain ways. Um, to assume that they're all going to follow the same path, and I think that's not maybe necessarily true. Um, they have different cultural uses and different pharmacologies um, and different histories and different applications uh, in policy um, and, uh, so, and so on and so forth. So I think, I, I think it's important to, to really carefully evaluate um, these drugs um, and these uses of these drugs on their own terms. Um, so. Um, <laughs> We've seen a, a, a dramatically shifting media climate uh, surrounding um, psychedelics uh, and marijuana. Um, uh, I think marijuana has um, really uh, taken the lead on that in a really significant way. We've seen that with legalization initiatives. We've seen that with just this, this massive shift that we've all seen um, and are experiencing with regards to cultural pr uh, perspectives around marijuana. We've seen the ads, we've seen the campaigns, we've, um, we've, we've seen the initiatives pass. Um, so clearly there's been some success there and there have been some real people behind these cultural changes. Um, these, things, um, these things aren't just happening. There's a lot of work um, and a lot of energy and a lot of fundraising and a lot of, um, and a lot of thinking that, that happens behind these large cultural shifts that we're seeing that's um, allowing us to gather here today. Um, and have these great open conversations about psychedelics and marijuana. Um, so um, we have a lot of these people with us here uh, here today. Um, just um, very briefly, um, I'm going to um, ask everybody to give a brief, just sort of uh, two or three minute uh, hello or introduction, um, just sort of explaining who they are and uh, what they um, have been working on with regards to drug policy reform surrounding psychedelics. Um, and or marijuana. Um, uh, but first I'll just do a brief introduction here. Um, starting from the end here, uh, we have uh, Mr. Aaron Houston, the former uh, executive director, um, recently former of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, if anybody's familiar with the success and the growth of that organization over the last few years, um, just um, say hello to Mr. Um, Houston. Um, uh, next we have Tom Angel. Uh, founder of Marijuana Majority. Tom's worked with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition and SSDP and has a long history of work uh, in, this, in this field. Um, now we have Jack Davies. Um, Jack Davies is current Publications Manager for the Drug Policy Alliance. He's done a lot of work bringing this conference together uh, and, this, uh, and this panel. Um, Jack's worked in drug policy reform for more than a decade, has worked in psychedelics for MAPS as well as for the ACLU, so has a broad perspective to bring to this as well. Uh, next, we have Anna Sostek, um, who is uh, the current communications manager for the uh, Women's Visionary Congress and the executive secretary for the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, uh, a group of clinicians uh, working for education um, among physicians and clinicians um, to teach them new ways to actually help their patients with cannabis now that it's um, increasingly legitimate. Uh, followed by Ted Trimpa. Uh, Ted Trimpa is the pr principal and president of Trimpa Group. Um, Tripa has been uh, working for more than a decade in government relations and has an extensive amount of political uh, consulting experience um, with um, um, uh, a lot of areas of uh, rights and um, policy-based um, 
initiatives. Uh, last we have Jason Salzman. Um, he's, uh, he's from here in Denver, um, so thank you for hosting us here in your beautiful hometown, Jason. Um, Jason is a former media critic for the Rocky Mountain News here, um, and the author of numerous books, um, including Making the News, um, a guide for activists and nonprofits, which is actually a very um, effective and popular textbook. Um, uh, and um, he's also the co-founder of Effect Communications, working um, for uh, progressive uh, PR clients. Um, so um, I'm going to ask uh, Aaron just to give us a quick start, um, just to throw in a little curveball here. Um, in addition to um, saying who you are and uh, what your current work is and background is um, surrounding drug policy reform, I'm also curious, um, I'd like to say a little bit about what to you this word legitimacy means uh, when it comes to psychedelics and or marijuana, um, if there's a difference. Um, but you know, we talk about the legitimation of these substances uh, in mainstream media and culture. Um, and I feel like we might have different perspectives regarding that, so a little reflection. Thank you. That's that's a great that's a great question, um, Aaron Houston, and um, I've had the tremendously good fortune of leading Students for Sensible Drug Policy uh, for the last three years. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Students for Sensible Drug Policy is a network of 3,000 student activists on 200 campuses, uh, managed by four full-time staffers working out of 192 square feet of office space. So, um, if you're if you're not if you're not already familiar with us, maybe check out SSDP.org. Um, I, excuse me, I spent seven years before that as uh, the only full-time marijuana legalization lobbyist on Capitol Hill uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and, you know, that lent a very unique perspective on how um, the legitimation of this stuff goes. And I also had the good fortune of working with MAPS on its Craker application for the University of Massachusetts, which was, uh, which was ridiculously uh, delayed over time. Um, so, you know, I've seen from both perspectives at this point in my career um, the legitimation of marijuana, both as a medicine and for recreational purposes now, uh, more and more. Uh, but also, you know, getting to see the stories um, that some of our opponents tell with respect to psychedelics in general. Um, but most recently with the electric zoo um, incidents and various um, electric, electronic music, uh, dance music festival uh, deaths, um, you know, those stories are becoming a lot more important and how we tell those stories, if we're telling them in a medical context, a medicalization context, or a recreational context, um, it, we, I think we have to be very intentional about how we talk uh, specifically about MDMA. But I think it's also worth reflecting on, uh, you know, Brad, to answer your question, I mean, le legitimization of, of, of drug like MDMA in particular, um, to me means that any, anybody should be able to use it. Um, you know, anybody should be able to use it with the proper, with the proper medical advice, but, um, you know, with some, some sort of appropriate control on, on the distribution of it. But overall, um, and MDMA is an amazing drug. And, you know, and I, I mean, I don't mind saying that <laughs> right, right on stage here. MDMA is an amazing, an, an amazing drug if it's, if it's not abused and used in the wrong way. It has tremendous potential to uh, connect people together. Um, and, you know, I think telling those positive stories um, rather than having stories about death and, and you know, uh, trying to figure out how we actually uh, get our facts out there before, uh, before the opponent's facts are out there, which are often wrong. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, my name is Tom Angel. I've been uh, working in the drug policy reform movement for a little over a decade now. I actually started off as a student activist with SSDP at the University of Rhode Island. And after I graduated, I uh, went to work at the SSDP national office for about four years. And then I worked on the staff of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition for about four years. And um, over the course of that work, I focused primarily on media relations and communications and PR. I'm just trying to generate um, positive news, news coverage about the need to, to change these policies. Uh, last year, I left my job at LEAD to start an organization called Marijuana Majority, uh, which focuses very specifically on trying to get people to understand and realize that the debate about marijuana reform is mainstream and a majority of voters support that. Um, because I feel like one of the biggest problems we have in the drug policy reform movement is that we do have majority support for legalizing marijuana and many of the other reforms that we support, um, but politicians don't treat it as such. They still think it's some third rail dangerous issue and they'll be attacked. So uh, we're just trying to let people know that this political and social space exists 
for them to embrace these reforms and they'll be rewarded for it and not attacked. Um, in terms of legitimacy, I'm, I'm actually maybe going to come at this question from a little bit uh, different angle. I'm, my work doesn't really focus on legitimizing drugs. I'm not so much concerned with that. I'm much more concerned with legitimizing the debate uh, about the need to reform the policies dealing with these drugs. Um, I feel like it's not as important to really change people's minds about how they feel about drugs and you know whether or not they would want their family members to use them. I just think that it's important to get people to realize that even if they hate these drugs and they think that they're the worst thing in the world, prohibiting them just makes them more dangerous and causes more problems. Thanks, Tom. Hi, my name is Jack Davies. I'm the Publications Manager for the Drug Policy Alliance and started out my career about a decade ago working in the psychedelic research field with MAPS um, and then shifted to working on drug policy more generally with the ACLU and now with DPA. And I think at the Drug Policy Alliance now and um, within the movement more generally, now that um, you know, marijuana legalization is not inevitable at this point, but it's sort of certainly uh, developed really unprecedented momentum. I think probably a lot of you heard Ethan say in the plenary yesterday that he thinks we've finally reached the quote-unquote tipping point. Um, so we're having a lot of conversations about how we can make sure that you know the door doesn't get slammed shut behind marijuana legalization. That um, that that we can take the lessons learned. From, from that movement and apply it to, to drug policy reform more generally. Um, and in terms of the question of legitimacy, I think, I guess that makes me think of different models of legal regulation and sort of clarifying what legalization actually means. Legalization is a, a process, really. It's, it's not the end goal. Um, and legal, within the spectrum of legal regulation of drugs, there can be an incredible amount of variation. And the regulations that might be appropriate for marijuana would obviously be different for, for other drugs. And we need to sort of assess the relative risks and benefits of each drug sort of on its own terms to determine what the appropriate levels of, of regulation would be. Um, so I, you know, th th there's a number of uh, bloggers and people like that that sort of pose this question in the media, you know, is MDMA the new pot or is are psychedelics the new pot? And obviously, obviously the answer is no. <laughs> um, there's, there's some similarities. Well, we're done here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, but I, I think there, by looking at, at what the what factors have have played into the, the enormous shift and the surprising shift in public opinion and public discourse around public policy around marijuana the past few years, um, there's uh, a lot of inter interesting opportunities to think about how that applies to, to other drugs like like psychedelics. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm Anna Zostek, and uh, I work for two organizations. The first one is the Women's Visionary Congress, which was founded in 2007 um, as a response to the overwhelming majority of men speaking at events having to do with drug policy, and <laughs> and cannabis. Um, so <laughs> so uh, uh, we host uh, yearly events and also uh, salons in various cities that give uh, women speakers and also some male speakers a uh, chance to share their work uh, in the field of consciousness expansion research and activism um, and art and so forth. Um, and I also am the executive secretary for the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, which is a California organization that's working to establish practice standards for doctors recommending cannabis and to educate physicians um, all over the world who are suddenly having the ability to recommend cannabis and may have no idea how to go about doing that. Um, in terms of legitimacy, uh, I would consider a substance legitimate when the vast majority of the populace accept that substance on some level is relatively safe, and when that populace has sufficient medical and 
educational resources to use that substance safely and effectively. Hi, my name is Ted Trimpa. Um, I was an attorney with uh, major law firms for 15 years, and then uh, three years ago, I actually went out on my own. And what I uh, do now basically is social reform and work with individual donors uh, to align and see the intersection of philanthropic spending with policy spending with political spending. And most notably, I've been involved in the gay rights movement, uh, particularly in the state level politics that have happened over the last six years. And then I've also been involved um, with marijuana, medical marijuana here in Colorado, and then working around the implementation of legalization here. So from my perspective, um, whether we consider something legitimate or not, if we're going to have an opening for the possibility of a change in the law, whether that be one small piece of federal law or maybe one small piece in some state somewhere, um, there's going to have to be some level of what I call political indifference or neutrality. And, you know, I'm not saying that the marijuana movement is going to be exactly like what the psychedelic movement would be, but I think for that opening of the law to happen, the possibility of that opening, that political environment has got to change. And how you change that political environment may have a number of components. And in my mind, the objective on that political environment change doesn't have to be acceptance and epiphany. Oh my God, I was wrong all those years. Gee whiz, let's do psychedelics. So, you know, this weekend, let's get in touch. <laughs> um, it's going to be that they no longer see it as a political bad for them. And they're just kind of indifferent. You know, like if people aren't getting hurt, I'm kind of neutral on it. And maybe we could be spending a lot of this other drug you know, enforcement money someplace else. Um, that, in my mind, then, is that first step for legitimacy that then will give, hopefully, the opening uh, for some type of legal change. Oh, and by the way, I'm with you. Women's Visionary Congress, I just have to say, if gay men and women could run the world, <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jason Salzman, and uh, I'll deal with the, or I'll answer the legitimacy question first, which is I think that it's, it's, we've reached legitimacy when we can say, yes, I do psychedelics. And you can say it in public, you can say it as a parent, you can say it as a student, you can say it as a potential employee of any company. That to me is, is legitimacy. Same with marijuana. Um, and so it's comparable to being out. It's that whole concept of when we reach that point where we can be out about our psychedelic use, about our drug use, then, then we've uh, reached a point of cultural change, really, which will, I think, precede the political change, which we, we actually saw, I think, with gay, right, gay rights movement, also with marijuana, that you know, it, 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 we have to look toward, uh, you know, cultural 2.0, cultural 1.0 about us, where we are, I think, with marijuana, and it will be totally different, but we, we will get there with the psychedelics, I really believe it, it's just going to take time. <laughs> So uh, what brings me, I think, to the panel is uh, I have a broader view of communications and, and advocacy and, pol and political campaigns. I've written quite a bit about it and have a, a small company that focuses on, on communications for those types of organizations. And uh, also my, my uh, family started the Telluride Mushroom Festival, which is an a annual uh, mushroom gathering in Telluride, Colorado which has, since its inception about 25, 30 years ago, really focused mostly on psychedelics. There's more to mushrooms than edible and culinary mushrooms, some of you may know. <laughs> but it, it, even though they don't grow in Colorado, we've had over the years speakers you know, who've been talking about legitimacy and, and talking in a, in a room like this. I mean, this room is legitimacy for, for, for drugs and for psychedelics. Talking about them openly, trying to generate the kind of debate that we, we want in, in, you know, in in politics and in our culture about, about drugs. So I think that's also partly why I was uh, sort of seen as someone who should be on the panel. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks, Chase. Well, yeah, uh, we have a lot of different perspectives brought uh, to this table here. Um, uh, that was actually exactly what I was hoping to have happen, which was that uh, legitimacy is uh, a million different things. Um, it's, 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 it, it, it's certainly important when it comes to political legitimacy, which is to say laws that do not prohibit 
uh, uh, the use of certain substances, and it's, and it's certainly and it's certainly true when it comes to our culture surrounding the use and representation of these substances. Um, it's it's uh, a, a legitimacy is also you know are we comfortable talking about it around the dinner table? Are we comfortable coming out about it? Are we comfortable um, uh, uh, making it known that this is something that we use and participate in? Um, that's another level of legitimacy. Um, you know, and, and there's ways in which uh, we can have legitimacy in some areas uh, and uh, still not have them in others. Um, one example of this uh, that, that I think Aaron brought up was, 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 was marijuana. Um, so we have this, this obvious rebranding um, of, of marijuana um, happening where, where it's, it's no longer something that, that the kids are smoking and no longer doing anything with their lives, but they're actual legitimate professionals and presidents using this drug, and it's kind of a thing that people do, like they drink wine, and it's kind of, we're starting to hear these more in the media and in a popular culture, but at the same time, there's actual concrete barriers to marijuana research uh, that are still happening, um, uh, that are in place because of old laws um, preventing researchers from accessing the drug. Um, so there, there's, there's different ways that legitimacy can, can be happening at a cultural level um, and, and still at a, at a, at a legal level, um, it's, not, it's not happening. Uh, so one, one thing that was brought up here um, just in this introduction was that you know, perhaps the answer to the question, uh, are psychedelics the new pot, is no. Uh, well, um, in that case, what, um, what, what are they? Um, so I just, I, I think we can be in agreement that, that, that marijuana has gone through a rebranding. Does this, does, does anybody, I mean, I, I'm, I'm welcome to entertain <laughs> um, you. Yeah, so, so, so we've seen a change in, in, in how we're talking about marijuana and how we're, we're, we're acting around marijuana as a culture and as policies. Um, have we seen that around psychedelics? Um, uh, is, that, is that happening? So are we even talking about a real thing here? Um, or is it just a small group of people who have um, started coming together and celebrating psychedelics? Is it a new countercultural revival? Or is there actually something new happening here? And I'd be curious um, about all of your perspectives um, on that, or anybody who would like to, to say something about that um, based on your experience. Well, I, I mean, I, I would say, um, thanks. You know, I, I would say that I think in the same way, um, and thank you for sharing that about, about your family's uh, mushroom festival. I love hearing that. I'm, I'm a native of Denver, actually, originally. Um, actually, my, my father right there started that. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Nice. Yeah. Church camp in Telluride, actually. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that in the same way, um, you know, one point that I, I did want to make is that I think a restricted medical context is not ideal, probably. Um, and so, as we move forward, um, you know, my ideal would be that that psychedelics are more available uh, rather than less available to people. I do think that. Uh, the legitimization and, and that acceptance that you're talking about and being able to say, I, I use psychedelics. I, I, you know, from an anecdotal perspective, I think I see, I see that more and more. Um, I, I think that in the way that many people use marijuana is a spiritual experience for them, they also use psychedelics and have, have a profound psych, uh, you know, psychedelic and, and uh, religious experience uh, when they've experienced that. You know, and, and that's a, uh, it can be a life-changing event for, for people who are familiar with that. Uh, it can actually be, um, you know, a, a truly groundbreaking event. So, in that way, you know, it may be even more dangerous to say uh, I use psychedelics than I use marijuana because obviously many more people use marijuana. First of all, but second, um, it is maybe even a more vulnerable and, um, and dangerous thing to share. Um, but in also in that way, it's so profound and so moving for individuals who have experienced it um, that it probably is an additional motivating factor. Uh. Yeah, I think that there has been a change in the last, say, 10, 15 years and so far as I think mainstream media attention on psychedelics in particular is not as hostile, but more like bemused. I mean, you still have people who think it's a danger and a threat to society, but compared to what it was in the, you know, in the 60s, 70s, like for instance, the, 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 the O'Reilly factor covered the Telluride Mushroom Festival this past year. 
and they send out a correspondent actually to participate in the mushroom parade and in the park dancing where a lot of people were, you know, using psychedelics. And the report that they showed, you know, it wasn't like Bill O'Reilly was pissed or angry or saying this is a threat to the country. He was bemused by it. He was opposed to it, but he's laughing at it mostly. And I think that's, that is a significant difference you know, for what it's worth. <laughs> Yeah, humor can be a powerful diffuser. Yeah, yeah I think um, something that's changed a lot with psychedelic research is just this past decade is that the research is actually moving forward on, and it's staying more true to the medical mar model than marijuana has in a lot of ways. As I'm sure a lot of you know, there was very thousands of studies done with psychedelics in the 50s and 60s for 20, 30 years through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Research was completely shut down, um, and it's only the past 10 years or so that there, there's been a gradual stream of studies popping back up uh, about psychedelics. Um, and perhaps because they're used by such a smaller segment of the population and perceived as being more radical or dangerous in some ways, perhaps staying with the medical approach is um, is, is, a, is a safer route than sort of jumping ahead to finding a political solution and taking, taking them, you know, treating them as a recreational drug like alcohol, tobacco, or something like that, which we've sort of carved out this special category for that's separate from all of other drugs. Um, you know, that brings up an important distinction, too, where the ironic thing is that, um, like what MAPS is working to do is to put both marijuana and psychedelic drugs at, through FDA clinical trials as a, to develop them into prescription medicines or to prove their medical safety and efficacy through the FDA. Uh, the funny thing is that the research with psychedelics has been allowed to go forward while the research with marijuana has been blocked. Uh, for political reasons, and um, that sort of like sort of a hidden story behind medical marijuana that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, that marijuana is the only drug for which the federal government has a monopoly on the supply of research-grade material. So no one has ever been able to actually, you know, the the opponents of marijuana legalization will often say, well, you know, it's not an FDA-approved drug. It's it, it, it's not considered a medicine unless the FDA has approved it. Um, but that's completely disingenuous because, uh, because of the monopoly that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has and because of the Drug Enforcement Administration's uh, protection of that monopoly by refusing to license alternate suppliers who could produce marijuana for FDA research. Um, it sort of forced uh, medical marijuana advocates in a lot of ways to, to jump ahead of the medical process and say, well, let's just make it accessible. Where with psychedelics, because the research is allowed to go forward, um, you know, it, it's been able to happen in a more gradual and scientific manner in some ways than, than what's happened with medical marijuana. I mean, it, pe people always, they, there's still something that's incongruous to people about the idea of states regulating a drug. You know, we've had the FDA since, what, 1906 or something? Um, we, there's a reason the we have federal standards for what's considered a medicine. Um, and so I think it'll be interesting to see how that process plays out um, as, you know, when, when psychedelics get further down the road and actually, if they are actually made available as a medicine, you know, if that triggers a broader shift in public opinion or if it sort of stays within the medical model at that point. Right, right, so right. Question? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, yeah, John. So do, you, do you feel like the the research on MDMA and other, you know, these other drugs is sort of moving forward a pace, and that, you know, if someone were to decide to say, you know, let's do a Prop 215 of MDMA, that that would somehow jeopardize the research that's moving forward? Um, I don't think it would necessarily jeopardize the research in that it would get cut down before, that, that it would get stopped necessarily, but it would, I think it would undermine the from the scientists' perspective who are working on psychedelic research, it would undermine their credibility. They're saying we need to let the medical, you know, the appropriate decision-making body for how drugs should be regulated should be medical science and health, health professionals, and we need to let that process play out. Um, and, I, you know, I think that would be fascinating if someone 
introduced a bill or an initiative like that just purely for public education, for symbolic purposes, for uh, you know doing public education and stuff like that. Um, but I don't, from the the stakeholders in the psychedelic research world, I don't think um, they would necessarily be comfortable with publicly supporting that because that would sort of you know, when you're a scientist, you're not supposed to know what you think the results should be. If you do, you're considered a bad scientist by your peers. <laughs> um, so there's there's always kind of this tension between, you know, people who are advocating for psychedelic research more in a political realm and the, the scientists themselves who um, probably wouldn't necessarily support uh, uh, a regulatory model. I mean, that's in a lot of ways how psychedelic research was able to be rejuvenated the past 10 years is because the scientists and researchers working on it really kept their intentions hidden in a lot of ways. They got degrees, they worked through the system, they developed reputations in their field um, outside of psychedelics, and then stepped out after decades of working in their field and said, oh, okay, oh yeah, by the way, I also want to look at the efficacy of this these drugs that happen to show promise for treating these particular conditions. Um, and so, uh, I think particularly the older generation of researchers working on psychedelics, um, that there would be some tension there. Yeah, I, th I think a, a major strength of the research that's been happening is that it's been so carefully designed. Um, and that it's, um, you know, a lot of the protocols are, are, are you know, very, very positively reviewed by the FDA. Um, and um, have some of the strongest um, uh, uh, double blinds, and um, not in terms of their effectiveness. The double blinds are actually very difficult to achieve in psychedelic research. But 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 um, there's a lot of effort put into achieving the double blind and blinding raters and blinding subjects. Um, there's also um, uh, you know a, a, an extensive long-term follow-up that happens with psychedelic research. Our previous MDMA study, for example, followed people much longer than a pharmaceutical company would tend to follow people. Um, so the research, because of the stigma, has really had to be very carefully, meticulously designed. And I think that kind of scientific objectivity, I think even when you suspect that a drug might really, really work, to have that kind of scientific, um, that ability to say, hey, these scientific results are replicable, and these scientific results follow this methodology, that, that, that helps create that so-called objective distance. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's, that's where that clinical legitimacy has come from. Just, just to sort of add to that, but I don't know. So I think it's important to recognize when we're looking at the psychedelic movement that even though it has grown in the number of people who are participating and talking about psychedelic usage and um, the media spin has obviously gotten much more positive over the years. This is still something that is primarily used by privileged Caucasian people who have the resources to take that kind of risk and have the safety in their personal space to take that kind of risk. Um, and, you know, I, I come from the middle of America and I can tell you that unlike California where I live now, there's very little going on in terms, in terms of psychedelic culture. There's very little that you see in public because to be in public about that in the middle of America is a very dangerous choice to make. So one thing that I think is really important when we're communicating about psychedelics is that it not just be quantitative research. Because most of the people in the middle of America, uh, most people who don't have a college education, this type of research is not going to be so meaningful to them. It's some numbers and, you know, maybe, oh, well, science says this is good, so maybe it's good, but it doesn't really mean anything. What's really meaningful is hearing stories about people whose lives have been changed. And you see this with the Sanjay Gupta, uh, his Weeds documentary. Like, th there was some research, but the thing that really made change happen was a story about this little girl with Tourette's syndrome who was given high CBD cannabis, and they, you know, they show how much better she's gotten and how happy her parents are. And right after that, I noticed in the media this big influx of uh, women saying that they wanted cannabis for their kids. And women have primarily, women with children, have primarily been used as like, you know, the point of fear, essentially. Like, if you use this, 
you know, if this, if this is legal, your kids are in trouble. But now all these moms are coming out like, well, you know what, I need this for my child, this needs to happen. And uh, really excitingly, uh, on a lot of levels, the FDA just approved uh, CBD to be used in an IND study uh, of GW Pharmaceuticals who created sad effects is, is, is doing this. But this means that children who have severe epilepsy will now be able to receive high CBD cannabis tincture through, you know, government approval. And it's much better quality than most of the cannabis the government's been providing. So that's an example. <laughs> that's an example of how telling stories can communicate with people who aren't going to respond to research. And it's really important. Yeah, that's a really quick turnaround, too, from those Sanjay Gupta stories to FDA approval of this idea. It was like a month and a half or something? Yeah, or yeah, it's yeah. like FDA officials are watching the news or something. So, you know, this has been a conversation about how, how comfortable do we have, um, how comfortable are we in talking about this and, um, um, uh, you know, there's been other examples um, of when telling stories has worked. Um, this story from Sanjay Gupta is a powerful one. Um, uh, increasingly, as, as more subjects move through psychedelic research, more of them are speaking to the media. Um, so we're getting more of that. Um, are there examples, um, you know, and I'm thinking, um, uh, I'm thinking of, of, of other areas of rebranding, of cultural rebranding, where stories might might work. So, so how, for example, did it work for uh, for the marijuana reform movement? I remember there being billboards. Of, um, uh, who created those billboards? Um, with these 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 you know illustrious professionals saying, "I am a marijuana user." Um, somebody must remember. Yeah, change the climate. Change the climate. Change the climate. Change the climate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there were these big billboards, uh, just just with pictures of normal people. Uh, you know, I am a marijuana user. It's just a person, um, uh, um, not that you would normally associate with marijuana subculture. Um, in fact, and I I remember seeing on television um, these advertisements just after uh, the legalization initiative passed here in Colorado. Uh, it was a 30-second spot with just people laughing the entire time. <laughs> Did anybody remember this? Maybe if you're from Colorado, yeah, I, you saw these? It's just like, somebody's laughing in a school, somebody's laughing just walking down the street, somebody's laughing sitting on a park bench. Um, it's, like, it's like an old person laughing, just everybody's giggling and having a great time. And then the screen just goes black. Puts up a big pot leaf. <laughs> it goes black again. And it says Colorado Tourism Board. <laughs> oh, amazing. This was like a couple of weeks after the initiative passed. They must have been getting this ready. <laughs> and then just re ch changing the face that we associate and uh, what we think people are doing with these drugs is just really, is just really powerful. Um, and these media stories are really um, effective ways to do that. Um, so, um, I want to shift a little bit and think, um, you, you know, a, a, part of this, um, uh, a part of the description of this session is asking about branding. Um, you know, it's asking if we're, if we're rebranding things here. So, if, if psychedelics are a brand, um, how, how have they been rebranded? Um, is, there, is there a market? Um, who do the customers look like? Um, and we've already thought about that a little bit. Um, you know, there's a very particular section of the population that is using psychedelics and able to come out and talk about it. Um, what does that rebranding look like? Um, is it just medical? Uh, or are there other ways that we've seen a cultural legitimacy emerge around psychedelics? Are there other ways that we have to recruit cultural support, um, not just for their beneficial uses, but for research and conversations about them? Yeah, it, you know, it's a great, it's a great lead-in. I would say there is a brand, and the brand is kind of hurting right now. Um, you know, and, and something we really haven't talked about today yet is, um, and we've been talking about the positive parts of it, and, you know, we've, we've been talking about discussing it in a, in a more uh, positively oriented way. 
Um, but, you know, really, I, I think recently um, our movement, you know, frankly, and I include myself in this, I think we could have had a better response to what happened at Electric Zoo and at the other uh, dance music festivals with, with the deaths. I think that we could have had, um, we could have done a better job getting experts out there talking about what an LD50 dose for MDMA actually is, um, what, what purity is, you know, what it means to have a test that says that MDMA is present in a certain, you know, pill or substance that a person is taking, um, but that doesn't mean it's just MDMA. And, you know, there's so many misconceptions about this. Um, I give Dan Safe a big shout out um, for, for their work. Um, they, had, they had a wonderful, I, I think it was a New York Times, uh, I think it was a New York Times piece that was pretty extensive. Um, that, that really, um, I, you know, I think covered Dan Safe's work in a great way and sort of showed, showed the really great harm reduction work that they do. But, you know, frankly, overall, I think that as a movement, we had a very poor response to, uh, to the uh, Electric Zoo uh, incident recently and the, in, the ensuing uh, incidents. Um, you know, and I would also say very quickly, if I could, that, I, you know, anybody know uh, how the Miami Face Eater happened? Was anybody know what the, the real drug involved in that was? I thought it was. Well, people, you know, the, it, was, it, was, it was supposedly bath salts, right? It was I thought it was MDP. Yeah, it was supposedly that. It actually was not. And, and that, that story went worldwide. And now we see, now we see, it was uh, marijuana. The only drug he was on was marijuana, actually. Um, but and the, the way the story took off was that a police, uh, you know, the police on the scene of the incident in Miami uh, said, well, you know, they came up to the cops and said, and the reporters came up to the cops and said, hey, you know, one guy ate another guy's face. Like, what do you think happened? And, and to the credit of the cops on the scene, they didn't actually speculate. So the reporter called, tried to be diligent, called the head of the police union, who was happy to speculate that he thought it was probably bath salts. And then it just went global, right? And then we had to wait for tox reports to come back, just as we have had to do with electric electrics here recently. You know, we have to wait for the tox reports to get back. And by that time, the story is global, right? And there's no getting it back in the tube. Like, so I, I think we need to do a better job as a movement of really thinking about when we have, when we have to play defense, what does that look like? Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick on that. You know, I, I feel like there's there's always a lot of reluctance to, to weigh in when these bad things happen because we have so many good things that we're focusing on. And I, I just, I agree with you. There's a need to, to really jump in and have rapid response and reframe the story early before it gets out of hand and use it as an opportunity to say, like, look, this is this is actually why we need harm reduction and, and to reform these policies. And I feel like we'll, we would be able to do that if we just kind of recognize the need and, and try it when these horrible incidents happen. Yeah, I think it, it's important for us to, really important for us to acknowledge the potential harms of both marijuana and psychedelics, or, or we lose legitimacy, essentially. You know, I think that's something that I'm not a huge fan of the marijuana is safe, so it should be legal message, because I think that sort of really misses the larger point that um, drugs should be legally regulated because they can't be dangerous. And even, and perhaps most importantly, even for drugs that are most likely to cause harms, um, it's even more important that we need some form of legal, legal regulation. Um, and that if, if we decide whether a drug should be legal or not based on whether it's considered safe, um, we're not gonna get very far. Um, and yeah, yeah, the, the, the bath salt Miami zombie example is the perfect example of that. Um, you know, really, I think probably the, the drug he was on the most was sleep deprivation. You know, that's something Carl Hart often says that I really like, that most of the harms attributed to s stimulants and some psychedelics are really the result of sleep deprivation. <laughs> if you stay up for days <laughs> without sleeping, you're going to do some crazy stuff whether or not you've been taking stimulants or not. Um, another thing in terms of rebranding uh, is that, I know it sounds a little weird, but there are a lot of people who really trust their doctors. Like, a lot. In fact, their doctor is the only person they will go to for health advice, and whatever the doctor says, whatever they give to them, they're going to take it, and they're going to, you know, assume that that's going to help them feel better. 
And so I think that medicalization, uh, it's not just a Trojan horse, it's a really important tool for reaching people who aren't, who are probably going to be a little turned off by the whole, you know, like, hippie movement with the rainbows and the tie-dye, like, you can still access those people by providing them the medicine in the form that feels comfortable to them. Um, and so I think that the medicalization of psychedelics and the research that's being done into that is actually a very important tool for that rebranding. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I want to drop this in here before Ted gets a chance to talk because I want to <laughs> add to it. Um, you know, it, it seems that, you know, you mentioned the Trojan horse, and, you know, that's, I've often thought of it like that, you know, it's like, is medicalization a way to sneak in psychedelics? Yes, definitely. Uh, yeah. Um, but, but, you know, maybe it's, it, it's more than that, too, because maybe there's a lot of people who haven't had amazing, transcendent, beneficial healing experiences with psychedelics. Maybe, in fact, definitely, uh, most people. Um, sure, there's a lot of people, we cite statistics, 25 million people have taken LSD since it was, yeah, but a lot of people haven't. Um, and, you know, so, so is, is medicalization more than just getting a wedge in? Uh, is it um, possibly also a way to access something better for people who haven't maybe necessarily experienced psychedelics? So, Ted, I know um, you mentioned that part of your work has been helping connect people from their philanthropy to um, the political work that their giving can, can do. Um, so can medicalization inspire people in ways, um, uh, or, or inspire people who aren't maybe already inspired by psychedelics? Yeah, because I think it would go to the issue of getting political indifference or neutrality. Because um, on the branding issue, I think it's much like um, how I approach campaigns when I do campaigns. Every attack has to be responded to, and it has to be responded to quickly, harshly, and aggressively. Because the way social media works and this stuff gets around, it, it's really hard to unwind something. And it gets difficult because you don't know what the real source is, but we have to figure out what is the brand we want this to be. Once we know what that brand is to be, then every single time there's an attack on it, that we respond with what that is, you know, our, our response, change the conversation. Because it is, I have an old lobbying adage, and it's much easier to poison a well than to dig one. And the one we're doing here is really, really deep. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Jason, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, actually one question, uh, you know, is, is, is there something in the media uh, itself, is there something in the structure of the media itself that's making our job um, more difficult, our job that is being encouraging honest conversations in the public sphere about psychedelics. Is there, is, is, is there a resistance? Um, and is it, is it getting better? Um, I mean, in my experience, you know, in, in the wake of these electric zoo, um, uh, horrible events, you know, these, these, these are drug war casualties. Um, it's, it's lack of education and lack of regulation. Um, that's resulted in these deaths. Um, you know, and, and in the wake of this, MAPS started getting some media calls uh, in response to what used to be a criminal law enforcement issue. So they would call the police, they would call the families, they'd get the sob story. Um, but now they're calling and they're asking for what the real scientific evidence is saying. Um, so there's this, this interesting way that these deaths have actually ended up with statements about research into PTSD uh, being woven into these stories about these concert fatalities. Um, so that's new. Uh, at least I think that's new. Um, and I know there's a lot of pressure from uh, editors in particular to get that headline. Uh, even when you have the journalist, and the journalist is really um, you know, really, really carefully attending to the details of the science, you know, often, you know, they don't have any control over it once it gets to the big screen. Uh, you know, and somehow the whole story is about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, uh, but the headline says ecstasy. Like, what is happening? <laughs> um, to which I respond, when you say an honest conversation in the media, oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> Military intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, 
we have social media, you know, picking up you know, right. and to fill in those gaps. So we have a, a actually better way now to respond to attacks. Not, not better still, but soon enough we're going to be on equal terms. And it'll be a, it will be a battle in social media if we're not already there. And I think that works in our favor. Yeah. Um, are there are, are there some are there some obstacles you know other than you know negative press surrounding uh, uh, the uh, quote unquote recreational use of these drugs um, that, that 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 are still facing this rebranding um, you know is are there any cultural resistances to the rebranding of marijuana for example um, are there any areas uh, in which um, uh, marijuana continues to be resisted um, as a brand um, and and um, can we see any of those coming from psychedelics too? Uh, I mean, the, um, I'd say that the biggest one, uh, the biggest one has to be that for the most part, you know, people don't die from taking an adulterated dose of marijuana. Whereas if someone takes an adulterated dose of what they think is MDMA, but it actually has a very high content of what methylone or meth, you know, so. Uh, that could be deadly, especially if they're mixing it with a certain quantity of alcohol. So that's a big obstacle, you know, is people potentially dying from adulterated doses. And, and, and again, the, the, you know, the, the, the ambiguity uh, surrounding, uh, you know, the, the amorphous nature of, well, is it ecstasy, is it MDMA, is it molly, what, what does this actually mean, right? Um, and very few people have a solid understanding, let alone reporters. I mean, when you can't blame them, very few people, humans, have an understanding of this stuff. What is exactly the difference between all these things? Um, that um, it gets very difficult to explain in, in 20 words, so. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think, I mean, the most obvious obstacle perhaps in psychedelics is just that so many less people use them than marijuana. Um, and I think psychedelics are probably always going to be a minority drug where, you know, according to federal government's data, about, you know, 42 or 44 percent of adults have tried marijuana. So pretty much everyone knows someone who's tried marijuana. And an interesting thing that came out of the, the data um, from the last election was that one of the best indicators of whether someone was likely to support marijuana legalization was not so much whether they had used marijuana themselves, but whether or not they knew a medical marijuana patient. Um, and, and, that, and, and they would be much more likely to support marijuana legalization than um, with psychedelic drugs, it's, um, it's not gonna have that kind of mass crossover appeal. And sort of historically, looking at drug scares and drug panics and myths about drugs, it's always very easy to propagate myths about drugs that are used by a small minority of the population. Um, that's why I, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, the success in rebranding marijuana hasn't really translated to other drugs, where marijuana legalization has shot up from like 35% to, you know, maybe as high as 58% since 2006. You know, the polls looking at should cocaine or heroin or LSD or MDMA be legal? Those are all, psychedelics are down there with like cocaine and heroin <laughs> below 10%. Um, it hasn't that, even though people have <coughs> sort of been able to see through the, the myths about marijuana, um, that, that hasn't translated into sort of a broader understanding of how uh, uh, the science of drugs works. Um, so maybe it, it's our job to amplify the medical benefits of psychedelics beyond their actual impact, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And as communications people, to take those stories and, and make them seem bigger. Yeah. So people feel like they know more people who, know, who do psychedelics than they, than they really do. Yeah, yeah. Cause we, can, we have the ability to do that better now with, with social media, creating our own media, so maybe we can counter that obstacle a bit. <laughs> Great point, Jason. Also on that note, you know, I feel like, I don't, you know, I don't know to what extent our movement has played a role in it, but I feel like in popular culture and in Hollywood, you know, there have been a lot of non-alarmist and even positive depictions of casual or medical marijuana use um, in films and in TV shows. Uh, you know, even back into, uh, was there an episode of Murphy Brown? 
about medical marijuana back in the day. Um, back. Yeah, but anyway, I, I feel like there's been a lot more uh, more recently, and we haven't really seen that kind of stuff with the psychedelics. So, if you know anyone in Hollywood, yeah, we're starting to a little bit. Happens with Fringe episodes. Yeah, this, this great sci-fi show, Fringe, it's, it very positively depicts the LSD use. Yeah, in fact, it's the main inspiration for most of their heroes' innovations. Um, yeah, we're starting to see it just a little bit. Um, but I, I think, you know, I have a question. I mean, all of this, I remember when cigarettes started to be marketed when they first became popular. Hey, maybe the rebranding of psychedelics can learn from the rebranding of cigarettes. Right? Weird. Um, <laughs> let's be careful with that one, though. Uh, yeah. Um, right, different drugs. Um, yeah, one kills you, one doesn't. Um, the, um, the tobacco industry put a lot of money into putting cigarettes into Hollywood uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. That's why you see all the heroes, all the villains smoking cigarettes, because they were placed there. They had representatives in Hollywood. Um, has there been any work, does anybody know of any work that happened within the marijuana reform industry to start to, to, to help encourage the positive depiction of marijuana use in the media, films, television? I, I'm not, a, no, um, I'm definitely not aware of, uh, of that happening and I, and I will say I, as a marijuana lobbyist over time to seeing greater, uh, you know, greater instances of positive depictions in Hollywood, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and fascinated by it, really. It, I think it's a purely cultural thing. People love marijuana, you know, and I mean, that includes creative movie producer people, you know. Uh, I, I mean, just a lot of people love marijuana, and um, I think it's interesting to see um, the, the sort of difference in acceptance with, you, you know, a media depiction of marijuana, for example, but I've been on panels at a conservative university, for example, in the last year, where I got a question about um, uh, uh, Madonna's use of uh, Molly, I guess, at a, contra, at a concert, she, she mentioned Molly or asked if the audience was on Molly, something like that. And it was, and this, you know, the moderator of the panel was just shocked and like indignant, you know. That, and I and I said the words, uh, MDMA is actually a wonderful drug, you know. So, <laughs> so, so but the, the automatic presumption is, you know, well, how could you possibly do that? So deeply irresponsible of her. Um, you know, as, as opposed to a show like Weeds that is, you know, commonly accepted. So. Still though, Hollywood gets pitched constantly by issue advocates, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, GLAD has been really good at it. If we're not doing it, we absolutely should, because Hollywood leads culture, which leads politics. So politics is the last kind of round. And, that, and Hollywood neutralizes politics. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't happen in science fiction first, it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about, um, you know, this, this idea of making things boring. You know, that the, the, the Ted's mentioned a couple times. Uh, you know, if, if this is a brand that we're moving towards. Um, you know, just um, on a... On a, on, a, on a side note, in, in, in my experience, it gets easier to tell the story of the rebranding of psychedelics uh, if we don't start with, uh, you know, the whole countercultural rave thing? And then say, oh, but they're actually medical. If you don't start from there, then you often don't need to end there. Um, which is to say that people know the old stories about psychedelics, they know that, you know, there was Woodstock, they know that people use them a lot sometimes, and irresponsibly sometimes, and some people use them for fun, and some people get in trouble with them, um, but what they're often not familiar with is that they have a history of therapeutic use, and many of the psychedelics actually, in fact, I don't know any that didn't, started either in therapeutic use, um, or in um, ceremonial and religious use. Um, so if we start with, hey, this, um, you know, psychedelics had a history of psychotherapeutic and religious and spiritual use and used by human beings for a very, very long time, and there's this blip in history, there's this, you know, several decade period in the middle of the 20th century where suddenly Western human beings decided to go completely crazy with them. Um, and that's really, if you look at the long history, kind of what's happening. 
Um, so rather than anchoring the story in this, in this old story, you know, moving towards the new story, which, you know, which Ted is suggesting could be, you know, psychedelics are boring. Um, psychedelics are maybe a medical term like stethoscope, uh, where, where it doesn't get the headline because, yeah, it's a psychedelic, it's a tool, it's what you do. Um, so how can we, how can we um, you know, from our different places and our different areas of work, um, make them boring for the people that we can speak to. Actually, I want to correct you a little bit. I'm not saying we should make them boring. I just think for the political establishment, they need to be indifferent to it and neutral. It's not, we, we don't need them to accept it. We don't need them to stand up and say, oh, gee, was, this is really great and wonderful. <coughs> we just need them to not really give a damn. Um, and I think we do that in part um, by getting the culture change happening. And once the culture change starts to happen and they get used to it, I, mean, I think one of the first problems we have on the branding side is just the term itself, psychedelics. You say psychedelics to people, all kinds of visions and things, literally maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we may need to be thinking about, on kind of the boring idea, is there some other word that could be used? Um, but you know, we can't escape what they are. We have to be honest about that. Right, right. Psychedelics are in and of themselves not boring. This <laughs> <laughs> um, so is another way, it's, it's not exactly making it boring, but bringing the, uh, the concept of psychedelics in the media into spaces that it isn't usually seen uh, can be an interesting way to reach out to people who wouldn't normally be interested by the word psychedelics. Um, the Women's Visionary Congress is just beginning a project uh, called Hints from Psychedelies, which is based on Hints from Heloise. And um, so this is basically uh, good psychedelic housekeeping tips for you know hosts to take good care of their guests and so forth. So essentially, you know, it's just tips about like, well, if you're gonna have this type of experience, maybe you wanna make a lot of food first to feed people, you know? <laughs> and so <laughs> we're, we're hoping to, to propagate this type of thing on on social media to get other people's experiences and so forth, and just put it in a different context, like put it into you know the Miss Manners type of context or um, <laughs> something unfamiliar that's also a little bit boring, usually, you know. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd be curious to hear from Ted a bit, sort of what your theory is about, sort of like the will, and since we're talking about Hollywood, what your theory is about like the will and grace effect, and sort of how, how, <laughs> how, um, uh, What's the will and grace effect? Well, the, there was a TV show in the 90s um, about uh, same-sex couple, um, and that for a lot of people sort of in was on NBC in prime time, so I don't think I ever actually watched it. I just heard that phrase used a lot in the context of the rebranding of marijuana. Um, that by by having sort of this very normal, these normal people on TV using the drug, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, who, who, who occupy this this category that people aren't familiar with. It, it, created this process that uh, allowed people to get familiar with them, even though they're a small minority. Like, you know, like we were talking about with psychedelic drugs, it's, it's always going to be a small minority of the population, but, um, you know, if there's some way to tell that story uh, in a broader context, I think that's the only way to really, to really make it boring or, or, or more normal to people. It's kind of what normal is, right? Yeah, I, th I think in part what Jack's referencing is uh, there are some people in the gay movement that reference what they call the will and grace moment. And, because you know, you, for, for me, the way I would have always looked at kind of the progression of gay, prior to will and grace, you know, you had kind of the Liberace time, everybody knew, but he said that he wasn't, but you're like, my God, you really have to be. <laughs> <laughs> then there was, um, uh, Jack from Three's Company, you know, you, you, everybody knew he was, but you didn't talk about it. And there was not quite so Nelly, not quite so Femme. There's a little bit more Butch there, some, but we really don't talk about it because we're really going to freak people out. And then with Will and Grace, it actually hit it head on, where even though it still played to some of the stereotypes, the stereotypes were in the context of not a crazy piano player who doesn't really talk about it, and wears weird, you know, weird, uh, wears weird jewelry. 
you're not in a TV show where you really don't talk about it, you actually do talk about it. Um, and then from then, it really took off on popular culture. And I think here, maybe the idea um, is that kind of early introduction of it, using some of the bad stereotypes, but framing some of the bad stereotypes in a little bit more of a positive way, so you can evolve it a little bit of the time. And then hope, as understanding grows, um, and legitimacy grows, you kind of hit that kind of will and grace type catalytic moment. Got to be patient. Culture. I guess a, another thing thought this brings up too is sort of that, you know, um, I think psychedelics, people working on rebranding psychedelics can learn a lot, not just from uh, public opinion around marijuana, but also sort of other things that are considered like alternative culturally, um, like for example, meditation and yoga, you know, in the 60s, that was considered this really wacky thing that was not really embraced in mainstream culture, where now it's like, you know, soccer moms, and it, it's, if you say you're going to a yoga class or a meditation class, people don't assume you're some hippie or something. Um, so <laughs> That's where you live, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the image has evolved to some degree. Oh, yeah. um, and so I think by framing it even outside of a, a drug context, that, yeah. that can be helpful in some instances. Well, and interestingly, you you started to you, you uh, started to slip up and say, "Well, and Grace, Grace doing drugs." In fact, they, <laughs> they did in fact do a lot of drugs, which was they, they drank a lot of red wine in that show, if I recall. <laughs> and you know, I mean, th thinking about sort of what it is that you know, what is what does it take to get to a place of acceptance? You know, that's it, the more you know somebody is doing something that's incredibly familiar and accepted, like you know, they're gay. That's kind of edgy. But well, they're drinking red wine, just like I'm drinking red wine. So you know, maybe maybe they're cool. Um, I, you know, it's I, I mean, they're they're I think. It, there is a really sacred, and, and you know, it's hard to talk about this in a, in, a, um, in a thoughtful way from a messaging standpoint, it's sort of more meta level, but there really is a sort of sacred part of being human, you know, the intoxication of the fact of being human and what that, and what that does. And so that, that's a, bo a bonding thing and something accepted that they did do and that you know, probably helped them uh, you know, relate more to average viewers. Yeah. It's a really great response to that question. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, and uh, if there are audience questions, I would, great, there are, super. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions. Um, so um, I think I might steal a microphone from you. And uh, oh, would you mind passing around the yeah. camera? Thanks. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. Hello, my name is Dominic. I'm actually from San Francisco, California. Um, so, my question is really, I guess, focuses on the actual title as Psychedelics is the New Pot. And specifically, I think this was mentioned that people just love pot. And the, what I think of Psychedelics as the New Pot in the sense as bringing life to those words. I think of, okay, I'm from San Francisco, and with the medical marijuana card, I go in weed maps, and literally, there's a plethora of choices for me to go to, to get the pot. And so, for psychedelics to get to that level, and the idea that it becomes the new pot, how would that process work in the idea of actually manufacturing and distributing LSD and psilocybin and MDMA. Um, do are we going? Would we see new technologies, new methods, or is it kind of like you know you really got to find a really smart chemist who is going to be able to diffuse all those chemicals and break it down for you? I think you need to find a Silk Road, but that, just, uh, <laughs> that apparently is not a thing anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier a bit that, you know, even if other drugs other than marijuana or alcohol or tobacco were to be legally regulated, there would have to be different models that are appropriate for those drugs. Something, maybe a really obvious point that hasn't been made, up, made here is that 
so people use marijuana regularly, often on a daily basis, particularly medical users, where psychedelics, when being used therapeutically, are only meant to be used perhaps two or three times in, in the studies that MAPS and other psychedelic research organizations are doing. You're doing a normal process of psychotherapy over 20 or 30 sessions, and two or three of the sessions, uh, psychedelics are used as an adjunct to the conventional psychotherapeutic process. So if uh, you know, if we ever reached the point where there was broader access, you know, or legal access was created for psychedelics, there would need to be more of a uh, system of su supervision involved. Um, and, you know, the analogy uh, Rick Dolan often makes is, you know, like getting your driver's license. So there would need to be some sort of training and some sort of certification involved um, before, you, you know, it wouldn't be like the kind of thing where your doctor just gives it to you and sends you home with it with a, a prescription for 20 pills or whatever. Um, so that, you know, and that, that I think also points to why, um, why psychedelics haven't been developed into a medicine up till this point is there's no profit incentive, uh, you know, for something that's only used sporadically, you use it a couple times, um, uh, you know, Pharmaceutical companies are only interested in drugs that, that are used chronically, where they're using it regularly. Um, so I, I don't I don't think there's going to be anything like weed maps for <laughs> for psychedelic drugs, uh, you know, in the, in the foreseeable future. There there might be a, a map of clinics where you can go and apply for therapy. And another thing to keep in mind, um, do you all know what microdosing is? Is everybody familiar with this concept? Is um, anybody not no. familiar yeah. with this concept? No? Okay, so uh, microdosing with psychedelics is essentially um, taking a very small amount, like with LSD you might take a tenth or a twentieth of a full dose. Um, and the effects of that are much milder, obviously. Uh, you can really pretty much have a normal day on a 20th of a hit of LSD. Um, and there's not a ton of research on it yet, but just from a few people that I've spoken to, I've heard that it can be really helpful with things like migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, you know. So it's very hard for me to imagine how that could become a prescription medicine that a doctor would just give you and say, okay, go take your, you know, 10 micrograms of LSD every week or whatever. Um, but it is something that could make it a more regular part of somebody's life as opposed to therapy with higher doses. That was a great point, Anna. Um, yeah, you know, a major question here is kind of unaddressed is, you know, psychedelics aren't just psychedelics. You know, there's a lot of different ways to use them and a lot of different ways to divide them up and a lot of different ones. So, you know, the path forward here could be very different depending on how we're talking about using them. And this whole issue of microdosing uh, it's just started to become a large conversation thanks to the research that's happening right now. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's a totally different use of psychedelics. And to say, yeah, we're going to take a tenth or a twentieth of a dose, we're going to take ten or five micrograms of LSD once a week for a few weeks to alleviate depression is very different than selling to the public the idea that somebody could have a beneficial experience that's also very difficult. People tend to like easier things these days. So, um, let's take another question. Um, let's go front right there. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, you can pass around to whoever is convenient. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm from Brown University Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, and every spring we have spring weekend at Brown. And SSDP offers um, a testing kit that people can rent out if they're going to be taking substances over spring weekend so that they can be informed about what they put in their bodies. Um, and one spring weekend we were interviewed by the school newspaper and we thought that they would do a piece, you know, about how we were reducing harm on campus and trying to keep people safe. And then what actually came out in the paper was something like, you know, brown students go so, like, freaking crazy over spring weekend that there's even drug testing kits everywhere. And, like, something <laughs> along those lines. Pretty much the opposite of what we wanted. And I wanted to ask you, in terms of changes in conversation about it, if we were to do something like that again, how we could prevent articles like that from coming out before they even happen, or really focus the conversation on reducing harm so that we can do something more than just write, you know, a letter back to the person who wrote that saying that wasn't our intention, you know, we were trying to reduce harm. 
So something about changing the conversation on campuses and trying to reduce harm at events like that. Thank you, that's an amazing question. Uh, uh, everybody who's ever dealt with the media around psychedelics has probably had the same experience. Well, I would just say one very quick idea, and I'm sure Jason can speak to this some more, is to, um, you know, the week of, a few days before, try to place a guest op-ed just explaining why you guys are doing this and why it's important. Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it, is be proactive. I, more than op-ed, I put out a news release with your message. I mean, it seems so self-serving, but it, it really helps the movement, especially your place like Brown, which has a certain amount of legitimacy. Not uh, necessarily uh, deserved since I went there myself, but <laughs> uh, still. Great, great uh, program, though. Uh, my name is Dr. Detroit, and I give talks at Oaksterdam on the psychological and spiritual benefits of cannabis, uh, putting it Plain English, uh, cannabis can reduce stress and is good for your mental health if we are in restraint, the 120th principle. We might even get more of our mother wit and basic intuition at play in our spirit guide. Could having the psychedelics be presented, branding-wise, as deeply spiritual experience uh, equivalent, a la Ram Dass, to meeting your God, the God within, healing yourself and forgiving yourself, can we present it as all use, as medical use, in the context of psychedelics being a sacred doorway to touch your fears, to touch your terrors, to purge yourself of your own self created toxins, and be a healthier, happier person, and open your heart? Can we use open your heart and spirituality uh, finding ourselves and healing ourselves so we're braver in our causes um, and better legacy for our, our deathbed. Can that work for the reshifting of the public's perception of why we do what we do, why we still stay drawn to it, and what benefits are we deriving which seem greater than the risks, if we are prudent, that are associated with this? Okay. Anybody want to take a step? Yeah, I, I think you bring up a good point. And then there has also been some research um, at Johns Hopkins University, Albert Garcia here, who will be speaking this afternoon. Um, his team has, has done studies looking at um, uh, pe uh, people taking psilocybin mushrooms not to treat a medical condition, but to, uh, you know, to have a spiritual experience. Um, and I think, the, the reason that hasn't been prioritized in some ways is because when you're, you're studying a, a very controversial drug in a clinical context, it's, I guess it's more politically palatable probably in the short term to focus on a very specific condition that you're treating. Um, and in, in terms of like getting studies through the FDA and things like that, it makes it a lot easier um, if you're, you know, if you're sort of prob problematizing the issue and you're, you're, you're focusing on a specific disease. Um, but as I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know, there have been some small exceptions carved out for religious use of psychedelics. There was a good Supreme Court ruling in 2006 uh, in favor of a church that uses ayahuasca. Um, but the, the uh, legal interpretation of that is, is, is very, very limited. Um, there was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed in the 1990s, in 1994, I think. Um, uh, which is how uh, the Native American church is able to use peyote. Um, but the, the legal definition of what constitutes an organized religion is so limited um, that uh, uh, in terms of sort of policy reform, uh, I, I don't think that, that, that there's a lot of openings there. But in terms of reaching the general public, in terms of, I think, reaching audiences that, that we wouldn't normally think of as supporting psychedelics. Like, for example, the 2006 Supreme Court ruling in favor of ayahuasca was the first case decided by the Roberts Court, um, and the, the conservative justices on the court supported the notion of freedom of religion in that way. So that, that can be a way of, of, of reaching a lot of different audiences as well. And, and like I was saying earlier, connecting it to meditation or other, you know, quote-unquote, 
alternative spirituality <laughs> modalities. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there. Just real quick on the other side of the coin, one thing that I worry about a little bit in framing it in those terms is, you know, more sort of mainstream religious people that we're trying to appeal to, seeing it as kind of a cheapening of religion. Oh, you just take this pill and you have this spiritual experience. I've been, you know, going to church every week for 20 years and, you know, I'm still getting to know my God and you just took a pill. So I would just worry about that a little bit. <laughs> And even, I mean, in terms of, you know, I guess, uh, newer spiritualities to the West, such as uh, Buddhism and uh, people who are very involved in yogic practices, the party line for most media, for, you know, Western Buddhists and Western yogis is, yeah, well, I took psychedelics once and, you know, it was really valuable and it opened my heart and my life and everything changed. And then I realized that I actually just had to meditate all the time and that was not <laughs> useful and it's a distraction. You know, and so you hear this a lot, so it's, it's, there's definitely a wall up even in terms of like newer spiritualities in the West about talking about psychedelics in those terms, and that's something um, that we would need to overcome to brand it like that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, first of all, I, uh, it, it's very, thank you for sharing that, Mike. Um, it, it is very difficult to, in few words, describe the power of a psychedelic experience. Um, you know, I, I think that it, to the extent that we need to humanize um, the use of psychedelics more, you know, I think it would work to have, I imagine, a television ad where you'd have a grandmother saying, it helped me deal with dying, it helped me deal with my terminal cancer, and then a, a vet being like, it helped me get deal with losing my arm, you know, in Iraq. And, you know, going through, the, you know, a, a mom being like it, it helped me deal with postpartum depression, you know, and, and you know, just flashing faces and flashing stories. Additionally, and Anna, thank you so much for bringing up the microdosing because this is something that, you know, we think about this as a binary thing, right? That, and I mean, understandably, think about it as a binary thing. There's the threshold dose, there's less than the threshold dose. And, you know, what we think about when we, when we consider psychedelic use is mostly over the threshold dose. Um, I have seen more people's minds changed myself by um, one person disclosing to another that they had taken mushrooms earlier in the night. And, and the, the sober-minded person just having a mind blown. Like, I cannot believe, you know, this person took mushrooms earlier tonight. So, uh, I mean, and it, I assure you, it is possible to take, you know, a small dose of mushrooms and act normal. Um, and, you know, so, so, so um, you know, and I've, I've heard it uh, used for migraines as well, you know, it, so uh, those same sorts of applications, but I, I think it's when, you know, it's when you can have that sort of mind-blown moment with the stuff that you really change your Communicating those stories is, is, is uh, important and difficult. Yeah, yeah. We have time for one or two. Over here. Yeah, let, let's get one on this side of the room. Yeah. Um, all right, all right, all right. All the thought is the same. My name's Ari Rubin. I'm the director of a state licensed dispensary in Tucson, Arizona. And I just want to say a couple things. One is I thought the movie Jobs was a great uh, example of. Uh, someone who's prominent and was successful using uh, marijuana and LSD to uh, broaden their horizons and see things more clearly. The other issue that I want to raise is uh, one that we're well aware of and one that I think that the psychedelic movement will face in the future because the marijuana movement is facing it now. I treat a six-year-old boy who has epilepsy like Charlotte did uh, with a CBD-rich strain. It's not an ideal medicine. It's two to one. CBD to THC as opposed to 20 to 1. And so we're getting the kid intoxicated when we don't really care to. I believe that the uh, issue of safe legal access to the best meds is one that's really important to the marijuana movement as we develop can cannabinoid therapeutics and see all the different things that it can do. And I think that likely if psychedelics are uh, given some opportunity to be widely used for therapies as opposed to state recreational substance that you'll see some of the same issues. Uh, did you have a question? <laughs> well, I just wanted to, to raise that as, uh, you know, how can we use what we're learning in the cannabis industry now 
to uh, hopefully have an easier go of it in the future with the psychedelics, which is probably a tougher sell. Yeah, and especially pointing to the diversity of uses that we could possibly see when we have wider access and wider use. Yeah. Right, um, let's, um, <laughs> I do want to take one on this side of the room, just to balance things out. Hi, okay. Um, my name is Crystal. Nice to see you, Aaron and James, um, and everybody else, of course. So, I like the topic of media. That that's one of my favorites, as well as um, positive psychology and or language, because a lot of times I come to these conferences or just talking to people, and I'm 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 working on changing um, my own language just to promote said positive thing instead of saying you know, reduce thing we don't want all the time. Reducing thing we don't want, oh, what do we want to replace it with? Um, so keep that in mind, maybe. That's what I'm working on. Anyways, so the media thing, um, I was going to say, who has seen the movie Limitless as far as the new one, um, as well as, I mean, I, so I, so I worked with kids recently too, and I asked this fifth, fifth grader, I was like, oh, what's your favorite song? And he, he's like, oh, my favorite song's that song Molly's, and I'm just like, oh my god, that song is terrible. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard it, it's on the radio. Um, so, I mean, coming from a culture where mass media is everywhere, and I'm personally addicted to the internet, and a lot of old people, you know, even if they're in homes, they're sitting in front of the TV all day up in hospitals or whatever. So, the media perspective, these shows, you know, Miley Cyrus combined with Breaking Bad, that was a good one. Like, these are, you know, you think, I, I've been accused of being kind of too silly for the movement, I'm not wearing my suit or whatever, but these kind of things stick with people on their off time when they're not working, so I don't know, just what you have to say to that. Okay. I, I would just, um, you know, thank you. My, my overall reaction, I think it bears repeating over and over and over again. Um, is that the way we change people's minds is by telling stories that make us vulnerable. You know, that is what really makes a story sticky. It's what makes people remember your story. Uh, it's what makes it emotional if you can make, you know, if you can make yourself vulnerable. And you know, we do storytelling training at SSDP um, to sort of give the, the, the format for storytelling because there actually is a format. Um, but one of the, the key parts of it is um, is making yourself vulnerable, telling the truth about yourself, telling a secret about yourself that you might not have told to people otherwise. Um, and you know, in res with respect to psychedelics, those can be powerful secrets and powerful, powerful stories. Uh, what's our time? Do we have time for one more question? Uh, I'm told we do not have time for one more question. <laughs> Thank you very much.